Good and welcome to New Covenant House on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Shegwake. I am one of the pastors here at New Covenant House. For those of our friends who are watching online, thank you for joining us on this morning, whether you're watching live or you're watching a repeat of this broadcast. Thank you for joining. God bless you in the name of Jesus. For those who are on site, this is a community church, and one of the things that we do is to build community, and to this effect, I and the lead pastor and a few pastors will be outside there at the end of the service. The whole idea is to meet and greet. Uh, We like to say hello and like to, you know, uh, uh, greet and, you know, I I give hugs, I give high fives, I give Bluetooth waves, whatever. Whatever works for you, (laughs) works for me. Well, for those born in June, you get a hug and everything in between. Hallelujah. Well, I also want to pause at this moment for the cause of um, appreciating God for the leadership. Um, Mr. Kibodis, you know how it is. <laughs> sorry, sorry, we have a little thing going on. I just want to uh, pause for the cause of acknowledging the leadership of this church, uh, whether it's servant leaders or pastors. I just want to let you know that I sincerely appreciate you. Can we appreciate God for our leaders, <laughs> servant leaders, pastors? Thank you for the phenomenal work that y'all do in moving the kingdom forward. Well, I also want to especially appreciate the very honorable PF and Pastor AK. Yes, put your hands together and appreciate God for them. You know, I just want to thank them for giving opportunity to uh, all of us to serve alongside with them and be able to deploy our gifts and um, serve God along with them. I sincerely appreciate this, Pastor AK. I love you. PF, I appreciate you, and I love you too. All right, all those done. <laughs> I feel like I have a word in my spirit on this Sunday morning. And so if you're ready for the word, I will invite your intelligent attention to the word of God in Genesis chapter 49. Uh, quite a little obscure text, uh, but just follow me and follow God, and it's going to be good up in here this morning. Genesis chapter 49, I invite your attention, and I'm going to be in the King James Version of Scriptures on this Sunday morning. Um, We're going to read from the screen because everybody, you know, reads from the screen. All right, so it reads on this wise. It says, God, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Well, you know when it's nice, I like to read it twice. God A troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. You know, with God, the tougher the battle, the sweeter the victory. And I don't know, I don't know, but if you, please, can you put that text back up this morning? Can you put that text back up for us? It's telling us about God that in the beginning of his life, it seems like, can, can we have the scripture, please? No? Very good. Thank you. The troop will overcome him, but he will overcome at last. So which means that somewhere in the course of his life, he's been overrun by a troop and he doesn't know when this is going to be over. But one thing God knows on the account of this word is that he will overcome in the end. So which means that God will be on the floor, but he's saying to himself, there's a promise on my life that says that I will not be defeated forever. So you can fire your best shot at me because I'll be back. And so I'd like to tag a title on today's text and teach from the topic, I'll be back. Help me just uh, elbow your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor. Neighbor. Oh, neighbor. neighbor. I'll be back. back. I want you to look at the other neighbor and just elbow them one more time and say, neighbor. Oh, Oh, neighbor. I'll be back. Well, I want you to throw your hands up to God and declare to yourself, I'll be back. Father, in the name of Jesus, this is your time. Lord, I have done my preparation. Please send your power. I've done my study. Will you please send your spirit? You've inhabited our worship now. Please, will you reveal yourself in the ministry of the word? I ask that you fall like rain, blow like the wind. I ask that you clap like thunder. Whatever you do, Lord, do that which only you can do. That at the end of this day, your name will be glorified and the devil will be horrified. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Somebody shout amen. 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 Amen.
Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. So, my friends, I want to start by saying something uh, that perhaps a few of us know, many of us know, or some have forgotten. Simple. God is good. Yeah. Help, help, help me just say it. God is good. You see, the reason why some of you are hesitating to say it is because we judge the goodness of God on the basis of our logic, our emotions, or things that are happening around us. But you see, my friends, we must understand that God cannot be fully comprehended. And so the goodness of God is not really up to, de up to debate of mortal man because our mind cannot fully grasp and function on the God level. Uh, let me also add to the goodness of God, my friends, and tell you that God is all-powerful, that God is omnipotent, and God has limitless powers. Amen. What this means is that God can do anything. But you see, you must understand that just because God can do anything doesn't mean that God is going to do everything. Oh, it's going to be good here this morning. I, I promise you. I, I studied. I studied. I promise you. Because, because God has self-imposed restrictions upon himself. And by virtue of self-imposed restrictions and delegated authority, God will not do everything. So God will not do for me what he has delegated for me to do because God will not use up my authority at any point in time. And so God is good and God is powerful. And then that introduces a dichotomy because if he is good and he is powerful, then there are some things that I expect him to do, which perhaps he is not doing. But you must understand that the power of God is guided by his goodness. Because, my friends, we are quick to think about the things that God does not do and we forget the things that he actually does. Uh, my friends, when I think about my own life and my own weaknesses and frailties, I feel like God should conk my head sometimes. Uh, but God has never conked my head at any point in time. Rather, he's made my hair even grow wavier. Because God is good. Somebody shout, God is good. God is yeah, God is good. And you know, for him to be God and for him to be good means that he must exist outside of man-made boxes. Oh, I feel it. He has to exist outside the box of our culture or religion or politics or even our belief system because he's good like that. You see, God has to function outside of the box because anything that can be boxed, anything that can be put within a boundary does not qualify to be all-sufficient and all powerful. That's right. So, whenever God functions, he functions outside of the box because God cannot be completely comprehended. He cannot be exhaustively explained. And that's why he is God. And you know, because he is God, I need the kind of God who can function outside of the box because life deals to me some out of the box challenges. And if my God is restricted to the box, then I'm in trouble. But when I woke up this morning, I remembered that the God I serve, he's all things to all people at different points in time. And that's the kind of God that we want. The kind of God that can show up for me on Monday morning and can show up for me at the same time on Friday night. The kind of God who can fix my finances and at the same time heal my body. I need the kind of God that can be healing in my house and can be delivering in somebody else's house at the same time. And that proves to me the fact that my God functions outside of the box. But you see, my friends, not only does God function outside of the box and not only is God good, I have to believe that God is good to me. So say to yourself, God is good to me. So let's do, a little bit of, let's do a little bit of theology here this morning. So in theology, there's this concept about the goodness of God. It's called one of the communicable attributes of God. Uh, what, what theologians say about the goodness of God is that uh, it's one of those attributes of God whereby God is first good in himself and then good to his creatures. i say that again. The goodness of God is the fact that God is first good in himself and by extension, he is good to his creatures because you see, God cannot extend goodness if goodness does not reside in him. You cannot give what you do not have. So God has to be first good in himself, which means that everything I experience in time Every good thing I experience in time comes from God. Amen. Every good thing I expect for my future is also domiciled in God. And so every act of goodness comes from the inexhaustible well of God's goodness. Hallelujah. And so because I'm able to establish this fact that God is good, it means that I can wake up every morning and expect good. 
Matter of fact, David puts it this way in Psalm 34 and verse 8. Uh, he begins to tell us, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. My friends, you cannot see if you do not taste. You cannot testify about something you've not tasted. And the reason some of us doubt the goodness of God is because we've not tasted of his goodness. But may I just quickly remind you, just in case you've forgotten, that the very fact that you are still alive is indicative of the fact that you have tasted of God's goodness. The very fact that you came to church this morning by yourself is indicative of the fact that you have tasted of his goodness. And so, like I said, my friends, I can expect good every day of my life, regardless of my circumstances or happenings or happenstances. Matter of fact, when I wake up, before, I, before my feet touches the ground every morning, I declare, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. And matter of fact, when I get a little bit happy, I say to myself, surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know what it means when the Bible says surely? It means certainly. It means without fail. My friends, when you wake up every morning, you have to declare to yourself, surely the goodness of God is on my life. Because God, my friends, is good. And you see, you see, you see, as I begin a journey in this uh, teaching on this morning, not only is God good, God gets the first and the final say. You know, I don't like to keep it very, I don't do very deep things like that, you know. Keep it very simple. God always gets the first and the final say. How do I mean? Let's go back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, round about verse 28, the Bible tells us, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful. Let's, let's even forget the other parts. It says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful. We'll focus on the other ones later. The, 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 the point here is this. Bible theologians tell us that the word here translated as blessed means to be empowered to prosper. Hallelujah. I said it again. It means to be empowered to prosper. So what God was saying to Adam here is that I empower you to be prosperous. And so, the first thing that hit the eardrums of Adam at creation was the sound of God's voice empowering him with creative abilities. So, Adam woke up to reality with an understanding on the inside of him that I am empowered by God to be prosperous in life. Amen. And so, my friends, when you look at yourself, the blessing upon your life, indicates to me that you are not material for failure. The blessing upon your life means that you are material for creative abilities. This is why the Bible says the earnest expectation of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Are you a child of God? Yes. Somebody holler, I'm a child of God. And if you're a child of God, you've been empowered by God to prosper because God has the first and the final say. Now, the blessing, my friends, is one of the first says of God. God empowers Adam and Eve and is telling them that you've been empowered to prosper. And you see, the blessing, my friends, is the devil's worst nightmare. Yeah, yeah. See, the devil would like for you to say everything except for you to declare to yourself that I'm blessed. Because the devil knows that the blessing is what is going to whoop him in his behind every time. So, can you help me make the devil mad and declare, I am, I am blessed? You see, some of you are saying it as if you're apologizing to the devil. I want you to say it with conviction. I am blessed. I am blessed. You see, you must understand, my friends, that when you begin to declare the blessings of God over your life, you are saying that you are beyond the riches of the enemy. And you see, one thing I need to emphasize is, you know, as Christians, sometimes we have these tendencies to believe that you know, our, our faith makes us superior to other people and all those kind of stuff. See, the blessing doesn't make you better than. The blessing really makes you different from. I say that again. The blessing doesn't make you better than. It makes you different from. What that means is that the things that destroy other people cannot destroy me. It doesn't mean that I'm superior. It means that I'm operating in something higher. So the blessing helps us to function above the systems of the world. You must understand when God created Adam, the Bible did not tell us that God made Adam to be subservient to anything he created. So when God created Adam, see, 
as New Testament believers, we were not created to compete. Uh, I know this may sound controversial. See, let me say it again. We were not created to compete. We were created to dominate. I said it again. As believers, so y'all can hear me. We were not created to compete. We were created to dominate. But you see, my friends, we don't dominate other people. So please be mindful. Husband, don't go home and say, the pastor said I was created to dominate. <laughs> it will shock you. <laughs> that's not, that's not. <laughs> we're not created to dominate other people, but we were created to dominate systems. We were, we were created by God to dominate the systems of the world and the kingdoms of the world so that by the time we get to Revelation, we can declare the kingdoms have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And so God created you and I so that we can dominate systems. As a matter of fact, what the blessing does in the life of the believer is that it elevates you to the God class to where you are functioning outside of the system of the world. For example, I don't live by the economy of the United States. I live by a different economy. It's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. It reads on this wise, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. The riches, of, the riches of America, I don't, I don't even understand. See, I don't live by the economy of this world. I live by a different kind of economy. Matter of fact, I call it, I live by heavenomics. I don't live by any economy of any system because God supplies my needs. And that's what the blessing does. And so, so, so when we begin to look at that, we understand that the blessing empowered Adam, the blessing upon the life of the believer makes us different from, makes our outcomes different, doesn't make us dominate people, makes us dominate systems, and keeps us above the systems of the world. But you see, the blessing also, the blessing also only is admitted by speaking. So for anybody who continually closes their mouth, they cannot manifest the blessing. And you see, my friends, the devil is happy for you to close your mouth. But you see, you have to make the devil mad every time because it's a world of words. The Bible says he upholds everything by the word of his power. So words are, are the things that sustain the universe. So if you are going to manifest the blessing, you have at the very minimum, you have to declare to yourself continually, I am blessed. Can we try one more time? Declare to yourself, I am blessed. I am blessed. See, I was talking to somebody during the week, and I said to her, I said, listen, honey, whenever you find yourself in a difficult place at work, and it's seeming as if you don't know what to do, before you begin to complain or think about what to do, just open up your mouth in front of your computer and declare, I am blessed. Because you see, what that means is that you are telling that situation, I am empowered to conquer. And there is no blessed person who will not overcome at the end. So you must constantly practice speaking I am blessed. And so, my friends, God's intention for creation was for us to function in the blessing. But at the fall of man, Adam and Eve gave everything over to the devil, and we couldn't fully operate in the blessing. But the blessing was always in the earth. And so God's intent was to find somebody, an agency through which he can re-administer the blessing on the people that he has created. Because remember, God is good. And God always gets the final say. So even though the enemy disrupted the plan, the devil could not get the final say. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad that the devil can never have the final say in your life? Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I declare, whatever the devil is doing in your life, it ends in the name of Jesus. I don't know what it is, but God wants me to remind somebody very strongly that he's about to speak over your life and his words will come to pass in the name of Jesus. And so my friend, God begins the scout to find an avenue to re-enter with the blessing. And the Bible tells us that this scouting goes to the Ur of Chaldees where he finds this idol worshiping man by the name Abram. Oh yeah. So God finds Abram and God begins to get into Abram's life. God begins to transform Abram's life and Abram begins to go from being an idol worshiper to believing in the God of heaven. And the Bible tells us that God will make a promise and God will make a covenant with Abram to the place where Abram then becomes the carrier of the blessing. But the, 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 the blessing on Abram's life was not really for Abram alone. 
because part of the terms of the blessing was that by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God was looking for you and I, but God had to find Abraham. And so God began to deal with Abraham on the platform of the blessing. And my friends, time will fail me to really x-ray the blessing in the life of Abraham, but can I just quickly remind you, Abraham had the blessing on his life and the blessing empowered him and made him wealthy. Abraham was a very wealthy man to the place where kings were trying to get his favor. Kings would bring gifts to Abraham and Abraham would turn them back because God had blessed him. Abraham was so blessed that he went to war against about four kings and he defeated them because of the power, the superior power of the blessing. The blessing, my friends, in the life of Abraham opened the womb of his wife after 25 years of the promise at the age of 100 and his wife at the age of 90. The blessing opened their womb. I don't know if you are here this morning and you're believing God for a child. You are trusting God for the fruit of the womb. God says, I should tell you, he's about to send you the blessing in the name of Jesus. And so, and so, and so, the blessing couldn't just stop on Abraham because God's intention was transgenerational. Let me quickly tell you that the blessings of God do not just rest, do not stay on you alone. This is why I can declare over your children to the tenth generation that your seed will be blessed. Amen. And so, the blessing goes on from Abraham, and it goes on to his son Isaac. And I'll pick it up in about Genesis chapter 26, round about verse 12. Uh, it tells us about, it, it, it summarizes the life of Isaac in this one verse. It says that Isaac sowed in the land, and in that year he reaped a hundredfold. And the Bible says he grew great. Uh, the Bible says that he went forward. He grew and it became exceedingly great because the blessing was on his life. But the blessing couldn't only stay on Isaac's life. The blessing had to be transferred onto Jacob and Esau, his sons. And so the Bible tells us that uh, um, Isaac had two sons. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Um, if you've been at church, you probably will have heard that story a little while where Esau sold his birthright for, for, for the Bible calls it lentil stew or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, which is why I'm never going to try to eat it because I'm not about to sell my birthright. <laughs> so if my sisters are watching, I'm not selling my birthright to any of you. Um, so, 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 so he has two sons. And then this one called Jacob who was a deceiver, or whose name means a deceiver, um, supplanted his brother and got the birthright by cooperation of his brother. And so Jacob is carrying a blessing on his life. And then at the end of the life of Jacob, which we now read in Genesis chapter 49, my text on this morning, uh, Bible scholars tell us that uh, Jacob is about 147 years old at this point in time in Genesis chapter 49. Oh, yeah. So, at this point, Jacob is carrying a blessing that is 232 years old. The blessing had gained 232 years of work experience in their family. Hallelujah. To the point that by oral tradition, he heard that this blessing opened the womb of grandma Sarah. He had heard how God enriched his grandfather Abraham. He had seen God, Father Isaac. And so Jacob understood the power of the blessing. Amen. And you see, if, 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 if anybody really would take the blessing serious, it would, be, it would be Jacob. Because Jacob knew what he did to get the blessing. He knew the extent he had to go for the blessing to rest on his life. And so if anybody understood the blessing, it was Jacob. Matter of fact, there was a place in his life where Jacob was running away from his uncle Laban and he was afraid because he was going to his brother Jake, he was going back to, to meet his brother Esau. And somewhere in between, he was hedged. Behind was his uncle, in front of him was his brother, and he felt like all hope was lost. And the Bible says he got to a river called Jabok. At River Jabok, the Bible tells us that he sent everybody away. And it was between him and his God. Listen, my friends, there are times when you need to get away from the crowd. There are times when you and God have to settle some kind of business. There are some times when family and friends, as important as they are, they need to take a back seat so you can hear what God has to say to you. And the Bible says that while he was seeking the face of God, the Bible tells us that he, he, he had an encounter. This is what is called a theophany. Uh, the Bible will tell us that he wrestled with an angel, but in reality, we find out that he wasn't really wrestling with an angel. He was wrestling with God. It was God showing up in the form of an angel. 
And the Bible says he wrestled with the angel to the point where the angel had to touch the hollow of his thigh. And when the angel touched him, the, the angel said to him, what is your name? Then Jacob, for the first time, admitted, listen, my friends, I've been a deceiver all my life. My name is Jacob. And the Bible says that, and, and the angel blessed him. And it was then that Jacob realized that he'd been wrestling with God, and the, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. And so he understood the import of getting this blessing. And so if you are like, if, if Jacob was like me, and I am walking with a limp, on the account of the blessing, do you think I'm going to just throw the blessing just like that? No, I'm not Donatus. <laughs> so, we pick up this text in Genesis chapter 49, and everything I've been saying was to set the background and the context of what's happening in Genesis chapter 49. All right? Can we go? Yes. All right. So, in Genesis chapter 49, let's have Genesis 49 once again. And so... We pick this text up. Jacob at this time had 12 sons. He had 12 sons. And uh, happened to be one of them. And so at his deathbed, he's doling out blessings in bits and pieces to his 12 sons. And then he finally, I don't want to bore you with all of them, but he finally comes to God. And then he says to God, can we have Genesis chapter 49, please, if you don't mind? It says, a troop will overcome you, but you will overcome at the last. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't know how you people interpret English. But if I hear this kind of things first, I will be shocked. I'll be wondering, does this man hate me? <laughs> but you see, my friends, as I was doing my due diligence, this boy was not particularly a legitimate child of the father. This boy was a child that was uh, conceived by, his, by one of Jacob's wives' maids. It's too verbose. Let me, put, let me find a more contemporary way to say it. So Jacob had two wives. One of them was Leah. Leah had a servant. Her name was Zilpah. Leah orchestrated for her husband to sleep with her maid. Does that, make, does that kind of make sense? So it was a hookup between the wife. No, I don't know how they were thinking in those days because I don't know that my wife will say that I should go and... <laughs> but this is where, this is who God was. So he's not typically a legitimate child. So he shouldn't really have been expecting the lion's share of the blessing. You know, he knew his place. But I did my due diligence. The name God means fortunate. Wow. Hallelujah. The name means blessed. Ah. So when the father was proclaiming that blessing on him, it felt like an oxymoron. How can I be blessed and the troop will overcome me? And my friends, that feels like the reality of our lives. If you want to be honest with yourself, sometimes it feels like the troop is winning. Um, I'll preach right where you live. Don't worry. I, I know where you are. When you've been single and saved, living sanctified all your life, and nobody ever asks you for a date, it seems like the troop is winning. When nobody's even asking you for food truck Sunday on a date, you know there's problem. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach right. I'm going to preach right where you live. Don't worry. Stay with me. If you've been working hard on the job, but when it comes to promotion, they keep overlooking you. It feels like the troop is winning. When you go out to work and you don't feel like going back home, it feels like the troop is winning. It's it's like what Charles Dickens says. It feels like the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. It feels like the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness. And let me tell you, my friends, socioeconomically and politically, it feels like the troop is where I'm going to, listen, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm just going to say it. My friends, when we can no longer go to the mall in peace, for fear of the unknown, 
Don't you know the troop is winning? One of my colleagues at work said to me, when, I, when I'm sending my kid in the morning to school, I hug him like it's going to be the last time. I said, why? He said, because when I send him to school, there's no guarantee that he's going to come back anyway. So I'm just going to send him with a hug and a blessing. In America, it feels like the troop is winning. Right. I have a friend on the, in the neighborhood who takes a walk like me, and in his gym apparels every day, all of a sudden I realized that the brother added a little outfit on top of it, and I didn't know what it was, and I kept watching and looking and looking. Maybe I need to get the same thing. I didn't, I didn't know. Maybe it helps you to lose weight or something. <laughs> Until I found out the brother had to put protection on himself in case somebody gets trigger happy. The troop seems to be waning. You know, it's the best of times when we can afford decent automobiles and move ourselves on decent roads. It's good. It's the best of times. But it's the worst of times when I'm driving with my family and, and, and I get pulled over, not because I'm driving recklessly, not because of the corrupt content of my character, but because of the color of my skin. And somebody pulls me, brings me to my knees, put my hand behind me and handcuffs me with four guns on my head. America, the troops are winning. And my friends, if you think I'm talking about America alone, don't get it twisted. All over the world, when you see nations fighting against nations for reasons that I don't know, the troops winning and it's very dark and cold out there the nights are getting colder the, the daytime is dark but you see my friends I realized that God was also God also experienced the dark in Genesis chapter 1 the Bible says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moves over the face of the water and God said let there be light see my friends all it takes to dispel darkness is light and all it takes to bring light is your spoken word. Amen. So when you declare light, darkness has to disappear. Amen. But you see, I want to pause for the cause. I want to thank God for being the kind of father that can identify with me where I am. Because he understood the darkness and he dispelled the darkness. What makes you think that God doesn't understand the dark places of your life? I want to park for a moment and just say thank you, Jesus. If you're like me and you can think about the times when God identified with your darkness, can you just thank God? Can you just thank God for 30 seconds for coming through for you in your dark places? And you see, my friends, as I begin to hurry to a close, I don't know where the time went, but, 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 but here it is. God has to in introduce a system of divine intervention because God, the troop have been winning. There was no way God will overturn unless there is a divine intervention. And for you and I, every time we have a promise from God, there has to be a moment in time where God has to square his shoulder and get in the middle of the ring on your behalf. There has to be a time when divinity has to step in to make sure that you get the victory. This is why I know that everything that happens in my life cannot, listen, if everything in your life can be explained by logic, you are not living in the supernatural. That's right. Because if you are living in the supernatural, there are certain things that the X factor of God makes happen for you that you cannot explain for yourself. And so God has this blessing that the troop will overcome him, but that at the end, he was going to overcome them. And so, I perceive that God kept declaring to himself, one day, just one day, you can strike me all you want, but I'll be back. My back is against the wall, but don't get it twisted. One day, I'll be back. And you see, when he kept declaring the word over his life, one day, the Bible tells us, when we begin to look at the scriptures in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, it begins to describe the children of God, the descendants of God, they were full military might, uh, people with full military might. And historians will tell us that the people of God joined forces with David to destroy the Ammonites and the Moabites because it had been prophesied over their lineage that the troop will overcome them only ever so much. There was going to come a time when this thing was going to be overturned. Hallelujah. I don't know who this is for, but God says I should tell you he's about to overturn. Amen. Listen, I don't know what decisions have been made. I don't know the places where decisions have been made about your life. But God says he's about to overturn them. Amen. And as I begin to hurry to a close, this is where, again, I want to drive home very importantly 
the importance of our confession and the words of our mouth. Because again, like I said, the blessing is administered by speaking. And this is where the word of God in our mouth becomes important. And we can, I, I cannot but talk about prayer and confession. See, in prayer, we're not telling God what he does not know. But we're inviting God into the scene. Listen, enough of talking to your boyfriends and your girlfriends about everything. It's okay to talk to your girlfriends. It's okay to talk to your homies. But are you talking to God? Because you see, the songwriter says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God. See, if you've been talking to God before the storm, you can have peace in the middle of a storm. Because he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The second thing is confession. Confession is a statement of truth backed up by the word of God. I'll say that again. Confession is a statement of truth backed up by the word of God. So which means when you make confessions, in reality, they don't sound right. They don't sound true. For example, when I am sick in my body, I will not say I am sick. I will say I am healed. Right? The Bible says, let the weak say I am the truth about the matter is that a sick person is sick. But the principle of the universe is whatever follows I am begins to start looking for you. So when I say, when the Bible says, let the weak say I am strong, everything in the world of strength begins to start looking for you. So every morning when you wake up, you need to begin to practice your I am's. You have to say your I am's and confess it regularly and make a decree prophetically. Because what you decree must come your way. You have to declare, I am blessed. Amen. Matter of fact, when I wake up, I'll be telling my, my sons, I am blessed. I am strong. I am sharp. I am quick. I am intelligent. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a terror to the devil. Because you need to declare these things in order for them to come to pass in your life. Amen. And oh God, a troop will overcome you. But in the end, if you've been talking to God, if you recognize that God is good, if you recognized through God's word that he will always have the first and the final say, if you've recognized that God never leaves nor forsakes, if you speak the word and you communicate with God in prayer, then even though your back is against the wall, you can declare, I will be back. I'll be back. Yeah. And as I, as, I, as I try to close this, this service, you know, sometime last week I was taking my walk and um, I got to a place and three fierce looking dogs were charging towards me and I was afraid. Because, you know, I didn't know the strength of the fence. I didn't know if, because the way they were coming felt like, man, those things were going to knock the fence over. But I just kept on walking. But in my head, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe this is the day. <laughs> I kept on walking. <laughs> but as I got closer, I realized that they couldn't make it beyond the fence. And the Holy Spirit brought the scripture to my mind. It says, when the enemy comes against you like a flood. <laughs> The Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. And God sent me back here to tell you that he's lifting up a standard against the enemy. But listen, that's not all. As the dogs kept charging, I now had the confidence and the spine to stand in front of them and see what they could do. I was like, what you gonna do to me? And again, the Holy Spirit told me, this is what happens. I've taken away the bite from the teeth of your enemy. And I just want to declare to about a hundred people this morning, God sent me by here to tell you, he's taking the bite out of the teeth of your enemy. The next time you see those things that have disturbed you, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You can declare boldly, I'll be back. Can we holler one time, I'll be back. On this side, I just want to remind you, the Bible says we've been through the fire, we've been through the flood, but God has brought us to a wealthy place. I want to tell you that whatever you've been through, whether you've been through the fire, you'll come out not smelling like smoke. I want to tell you that when you go through the waters, it will not drown you so that you can confidently declare to the devil, I'll be back. Can you holler, I'll be back? I'll be back. Let's try it on. Let's try it on this side of the church. Let's try it on this side of the church. My friends, I'm about to go take my seat, but I just want to remind you guys 
that when you, beat, when you go through the fire, he'll be dead. The Bible says, through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies under us. And God sent me to remind somebody that you will come out of the fire without smelling like smoke. Amen. God says, I should tell you that whatever the devil brings up against you, he will lift up the standard. Amen. So that you can boldly declare to the devil, I'll be back. I'll can you declare, I'll be back? I'll be back. I finished. I finished. At the end, I want to remind you that God always has the final say. That God will win the battle even without getting in the ring with the devil. And that whatever the enemy meant for evil against your life, God will turn it around for good. That God, even though the enemy seems to be winning right now, is coming you will be able to declare not just I'll, I'll tell the devil in his face, I am. I'm back. I am. Can I hear about a hundred people declare I'm back? Oh yeah, baby, I'm back. I don't know what the devil is doing against your life, but God sent me to tell you, you can declare in the face of the devil, I'm back. Can somebody holler, I'm back? I'm back. My name is Shags and I approve this message. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I started talking about the goodness of God, but Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. One of the expressions of the goodness of God is the fact that he calls us back unto himself as our father, that he shows us love in ways that we cannot comprehend. So I'm calling out to anybody who has not met Jesus, who don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that if you're here and you've not made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you've not made Jesus, you've not made the decision for Jesus, this is the opportunity where God says, I'm here with my arms stretched wide and waiting for you to come back to me because I'm good to you just like that. Uh, that I, I, I'm, I'm overlooking and willing to overlook your errors, faults, your frailties and your mistakes and I'm willing to embrace you as my own. And so if you want to make that decision for God on today and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, very simply say with me, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of salvation. With my heart, I believe, and with my mouth, I confess that you are my Lord. You died for my sins. You rose again triumphantly. Come into my heart. Be my God from this day forward in Jesus' name. Well, if you said that prayer, what you just declared to the devil is, I'm back. I'm back. Can we just honor God with a clap and appreciate our friends who are back? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, so we're going to go further into this service. And um, before we go further into this service, actually, if you said that prayer, accepting Jesus into your heart, uh, there's a number on the screen. Please text the word RENEW, R-E-N-E-W, to the number 94000. Text the word RENEW to 94000. And somebody will be reaching out to you with next steps and just help you as you make that journey and decision for Christ. Amen?